Okay, today we're going to be talking about <clears throat> first concept of the course. Normal stress and strain. Okay, and this word normal is significant. Um, it's going to be the kind of there's several kinds of stress that we're going to evaluate or look at throughout the course. This idea of it being normal to a plane is the simplest setting, and so it's often where we begin our study. So if we look at a, an axial bar here, loaded, some load P, then your intuition immediately tells you what would happen to this bar. It's going to lengthen in the axial direction. So if we draw the bar in its elongated state, it's going to look something like that. If we started out at length L, then this elongated bar is going to be length L plus some elongation delta. So we'll call that elongation. Now, <clears throat> since there's an external force, there are external forces applied to this object, you would expect that f internal forces would develop on the, in the interior of the object to resist that external force. So one way to think about this is we can take a cut plane, cut that bar anywhere along its length, and examine how the internal forces are distributed on the surface here, on the cross-sectional surface. In this case, they're going to be uniformly distributed over the cross-sectional area. So here's the cross-sectional area, the bar. And if we were to look at this distributed force and we were to add it all up over this cross-sectional area, it would come out to be equal to the applied force, P. Okay, <clears throat> so in this case, this distributed force and distributed internal force over this cross-sectional surface area is called would be, would be called a normal stress because it's normal to this cut plane. So the way we write stress is sigma, in this case, is going to be simply equal to P over A. So this Greek letter is almost exclusively used to represent what's called stress. Now this equation over here that we're using to calculate the stress, of course, depends on the particular setup that we've selected to the left. So as we move through the class, we're going to look at different scenarios where this concept of stress is going to become more and more general until eventually we come to kind of a, a very general understanding of how to understand stress along any cut in a member that's, that's loaded up in various ways. Another important principle that is intimately related to stress is called strain. And we use the term epsilon for strain. And it's, it's going to be, a way to understand this is, is kind of the change in length per unit length of the object, the member. So in this case, we have our elongation. That's our change in length over our total length. And so this number, this value here is unitless because it's length per length. So that's an important concept. It's a unitless quantity strain. Stress, however, is not unitless. If you look at the units here, P is a unit of force over area, right? So it's force over some length squared, as your intuition would, would indicate. 
Okay, now just a little vocabulary. Uh, we call this the stress tensile, so tensile stress is the stress that developed when the bar is pulled by P. So a tensile stress is kind of this concept of tension and so in this case this is this case that I've drawn this is a case of putting a bar in tension and so we call these tensile stresses. The other example of course would be compressive stress and that's just the opposite idea. So the bar is now being pushed in by some stress that's acting by some force that's acting in the other direction. Okay so that's probably goes along with the intuition that you already have. Okay, <clears throat> so now we get to a very important point here. If you look at this way that we've measured stress, you can see that it highly depends on the geometry of the object. So in this case, this is a very simple prismatic, we would say bar. Uh, the loading P is applied in a very specific way. And so all of these configurational ideas contribute to what stress means. So the internal forces depend on, for example, the nature of the applied loads and the geometry of the object and its composition, what the material is inside that, that, is, um, that makes up the bar or the object that you're looking at. Okay, so let's take a look at kind of the limitations of this first idea of stress. So we have sigma is equal to P over A. And if we want to just write down quickly the limitations of this idea, meaning under what circumstances is this the right equation to compute stress, there are a couple of things. So one, the axial force must act through the centroid of the cross-sectional area. So if you recall the example that we're looking at is we have a bar, we made a cut, okay, and so the centroid for this cross-section will be right there, so that P actually has to be acting right through that centroid. If it was offset slightly, then the condition of stress would be much more complicated, and this equation would no longer make any sense. Okay, another important limitation is the bar must be prismatic. be prismatic. So what that means is prismatic, this word prismatic just means that it has the same cross-section everywhere. So if you move through the bar from left to right, that cross-sectional area doesn't change size or shape. That's a prismatic member. Okay, now the third thing is important. Um, it now has to do with the composition of the bar. So you could imagine that if this bar was made of steel or if it was made of wood, for example, the, the, the internal forces that develop would be different depending on the composition, the material composition. So in order for this equation to be valid, the material must be these are two very important words, homogeneous and isotropic. Okay. Two important words that are going to come up again and again throughout the course. 
So homogeneous means it's the same material composition. So the same material composition everywhere. Okay, so it doesn't go from steel to wood to some other material as you move throughout the, the bar. And then isotropic means that the material behaves the same in all directions. Okay. Kind of a classic example of an anisotropic material would be wood, where the grains have strong influence on the behavior of the internal forces. So if you were to look at the stress, for example, normal to the grain versus perpendicular to the grain, it's going to be quite different. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's go ahead and look at an example. So we're going to look at a very simple example here. We're going to have a bar. This time we're going to have a rectangular cross section. Okay, so we have this rectangular bar. Again, it's going to be loaded with some axial force P. And we're going to assume that, you know, the assumptions hold. In other words, this force acting through the centroid is prismatic and that it has a homogeneous and isotropic composition, the material. Further, we're going to be given the fact that given this load P, the elongation was 0 0.001 feet. And the question that we want to ask now is, given this information, what is the strain at x equal 6 inches? Okay, a few more pieces of information. The length here is 2 feet. Okay. So th this is quite a simple application of the equations that we just wrote down previously. We know that the strain epsilon is simply delta over L. And since we're given delta, it's 0 0.001 feet. And we're given L, 2 feet. And we know directly from a very simple calculation that the strain is a unitless value of 0 0.005. Okay, now let's use this example to help inform our idea a little bit more of what, what strain means, more from a mathematical point of view. So if you were to graph this idea of strain, you could create a, a graph where you've got basically the distance x along the bar. It's going to be the x-axis. And then we're going to have the elongation delta. That's what's going to be along the y-axis. Okay, and so if you look at the... One way to think about this is it doesn't really matter where you attach the bar, but let's say this is our origin, this left face. Then the idea, the question you ask yourself is at x equal to 0, so at this left face, what is the delta? And the delta is 0, because we're assuming that that's the beginning of our origin. And now we also know that at the right side, at length 2 feet, or at length L, that our elongation is delta. Now the question becomes, how do you connect these two dots? How do you connect these two dots? Now, 
depending on the model that you use, the way you connect these two dots might be a curve, might be something complicated. You could imagine something of a very sophisticated composition having that behavior. But in this class, we look at uh, what we call just very small deformations. And uh, in that case, right, if delta, see how, you see how tiny delta is compared to the overall length, then we often just assume that there's a linear relationship here. So we just connect these lines, these dots with a line. Okay. Now, that function right here, this function, we would call this function delta x. And the question is, is well, what is delta x? Well, this is a line, so it's some slope times x. And what's this slope? Well, the slope is delta over L. So it's delta L x. Right, so if x is equal to L, then it cancels and we get back delta. If x is equal to zero, then delta is zero. And that makes sense. And so this right here, for the purposes of this very simple idea of strain, this is, the strain is, is a slope. The slope of this curve, how the elongation depends on a position x along the bar. And this is going to come up again and again, and I will continue to point this out as it, it will grow in sophistication, but these, these, this idea of there being functions and we're looking at derivatives or integrals becomes a very fundamental idea of how we measure things like strain and stress in the mechanical context. Now, <clears throat> The question then becomes, okay, so if this is strain, delta over L, then what is the strain at some random position x? So if I was to measure strain right here, let's say, let's get strain 1, and then I was to measure strain here, let's say strain 2, what's what are strain 1 and strain 2? Well, since strain is delta over L, and delta over L is the slope, we know that the slope of a line is constant. So the strain in this bar is constant everywhere. So regardless of where you look, that quantity of strain will be the same value everywhere in the bar. And so this, this line, this linear relationship between two quantities, in this case the positional quantity x and the elongation delta, and there's a linear relationship. That's a very important part of this course. In other words, I think I would say this course only deals with linear relationships. Okay, and that may not make a lot of sense yet, but I'll continue to hammer on this concept as we go throughout the course, because it will come up again and again, and it's one of these unifying ideas that if you understand it, it's going to make a lot of the different concepts uh, the same concept. Okay, let's take a look at one more example. In this case, let's say our stress, sigma, is 1 ksi kip per square inch. So a kip is 1,000 pounds. So it's kip inches squared. And the cross-sectional area, let's say, here's the cross-sectional area that we're measuring the stress with respect to is circular, and its radius, r, is one inch. Okay, then what is the resultant axial force 
that when applied created the this stress condition the stress state So think about that for a minute. We're given a cross-section of geometry, and we're given some stress. Uh, in the background, we're assuming that all of those assumptions are satisfied in terms of it being prismatic and the uh, axial force acting through the centroid and the composition being homogeneous and isotropic. Then, given the internal force, we want to try and figure out, well, then what was the axial force or the applied external force that caused this particular stress state. Again, a very simple application of some equations that we just looked at. In this case, sigma is equal to P over A. But in this case, we know sigma and we know A and we don't know P. Okay, and so simply rearranging gives us sigma A. And so if you plug in the values, you get um, pi kips. Let's move on now to a slightly more complicated example. The geometry of this example is as this, we draw it. So we have these two cylindrical objects on top of each other. So let's say that this is cross section A1. We'll say that this is cross section A2. And now we're going to have a force P1 applied. Again, it's really being applied to the centroid here, but we kind of distribute it just to give you some perspective of what's going on. So if you were to add up this distributed force, it would give you a resultant force equal to P1 applied on this face. And then through the centroid down here, we have a force P2. Okay, so let's just look at this a little bit. So let's ask just one question here. So we want to find P2 so that the stress in the upper part is Sigma one. So what is Sigma two? Okay, so Sigma one. So Sigma one is going to be equal to P one plus P2, explain that in a minute, over A1. Now if you look, sigma 1 corresponds to the stress that develops in this member. And notice that it's going to be equal to this applied force plus this applied force. Or, and it, we're assuming that this is fixed up here at the top. So this object is being pulled down by the sum of P1 and P2 and then the cross-sectional area is just A1. So that's what the formula you get for sigma 1. Okay, now it's asking for P2. So what does P2 have to be so that the stress in the upper part is sigma 1? So we're assuming that we've been given sigma 1, P1, and A1, and it's asking for P2. Okay. So that's just a simple rearranging here, which leads to P2 is equal to A1 sigma 1 minus P1.